So let me explain first of all that what I share is about by much reading and borrowing from others, but it's also the result of 30 years ministering for the Lord. And I will try this morning to give credit to those who have helped me as I go along. Recently, the Holy Spirit revealed to me the number of people within the church who were suffering from rejection. And it became apparent to me that there's a general problem running through the Christian church. In fact, it's not just the church, it's a society problem. Now, I'm not talking just to Trinity. I want to talk to the church in general. I know there will be many listening in. And one of the reasons I recognize this problem is that I once suffered from it. It once dominated my life. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me take you back to the beginning. I had just started ministry, and I was becoming aware that I had a problem in my life. Um, An emotional problem. And the problem was mine. But it didn't stop me from trying to push it onto other people. Have you ever noticed that when we're struggling, that the first thing that we try to do is to drag others into our hurt and our weakness? That's one of the things that happens. You don't, might not even realize it, but when we get down there in the valley, we want to drag as many down there as we possibly can. And we're, as I say, we're, very often we're not aware of it. Because what happens, that problem has become such a part of us that it's moving without us even realizing what's going on. Well, just after I came to the Lord, I was having a quiet time with the Lord, and I remember him, oh, it's very clear to me that this thought came into my mind. You need to get over yourself. You need to get over yourself. Now that didn't make a lot of sense to me at the time. Because I totally lacked any understanding. I had no knowledge or wisdom of what the problem was in my life. But that might give you an idea of how God moves. How God moves in individual lives. You know, very often before you were aware of the problem, God is speaking into it. Amen? Even before we become aware of it, before we start scratching the the spots and all that, God is aware of what we're going through. And one day, I had an invitation from a fellow pastor, some of you will know him, Chris Woods. He used to be the hospital chaplain as well. Well, Chris uh, and another gentleman were ministering at a church in Shaftesbury. And he asked me if I would come to one of his Saturday morning meetings. They had a a very special meeting. They'd invited an international speaker. But they were aware that as a fellowship, there were only about 20 of them, and they were going to be a bit thin on the ground for this international speaker. So I dragged Barbara along to the meeting with me, with the understanding that we were just going to make the numbers up. And of course, guess where I sat? In the back row. And I had totally, totally the wrong attitude. It was a Saturday morning. I had other things I wanted to do. And I didn't really want to be there. That's the truth of it. The speaker was introduced, and his name was Steve Hepton. And by the way, in passing, he has written a wonderful little thin book called Rejection. And obviously, he shared that he wanted to talk about rejection. Now, I've got to tell you that I'm sitting at the back and I didn't even know what rejection was. Uh, Until that moment, I don't believe I had any understanding at all about the emotional problem of rejection. (coughs) But you know, the moment he started to speak, he was just talking to me. Have you ever been in a meeting 
where someone starts talking about something and it's just to you that they're talking. He was dotting I's and crossing T's and it was just for me. Everything he shared, I was able to identify within my life. And for two hours, I sat absolutely spellbound and I was hanging on every word. Well, at the end of the teaching, he offered ministry to those who needed it. Well, I was down the front. I was first in the queue. I was down there. And Steve came up to me and he put his hands on me. Oh, and I began to manifest. I was told afterward that it was such a violent manifestation that many of those waiting in the queue for ministry quietly went and returned back to their seats. <laughs> it ended up with me rolling around the platform manifesting. Friends, that was the beginning of my awakening to the problem of rejection. And then God, in his wisdom, brought a book before me, a lovely title, I Was Always On My Mind. And if you got rejection, that's a fact. I was always on my mind. And it was written by a gentleman called Steve Sampson. What I discovered, I discovered that the power of the flesh far exceeds that of any demon in stopping the work of God in our lives. Did you know that? The flesh is more powerful than the demonic. The Lord really wants to dethrone you and I from the center of our lives so that we can victoriously carry out his purpose. It was extremely enlightening reading that book. And following on for over the years, I received ministry and I had further deliverance from that rejection. I'm going back 30 years now. So it might be said that on that subject, I've got first-hand knowledge. But even better than that, I've got experience. Now how many of you know that experience is far more powerful than knowledge. I meet many of these walking encyclopedias who've got their heads full of knowledge, absolutely. They've read this book and they've read that book, but they've got no experience whatsoever. And most of the knowledge that they've got is meaningless. Until it is formed into experience, it doesn't mean anything. Well, hallelujah, I've got to be honest, I had about... 30, 40 years of experience of the rejection. So I, I knew what it was all about. I said at the beginning that there is a problem within the church. But I also went on to say it actually affects the whole of society. Truthfully, there are many who are struggling to live within the church and within society and they don't even realise that they're struggling with rejection. So let me start by encouraging all of you. Rejection starts in a person by simply by not being wanted. That's the simplest way of rejection getting there. Not being wanted. In my own personal case, my mother used to tell me quite often throughout my childhood, don't know where you come from, you weren't wanted. Now, it wasn't said with malice, but you know, eventually it entered into me and it damaged my love. Friends, let me encourage anyone who's been rejected and who suffers from rejection, let me encourage you, and I'm going to use a Bible character to encourage you. It's the story of David. The story of David doesn't start on the battlefield and it doesn't start with Goliath. 
It starts on a hillside of Bethlehem, where he was watching his father's sheep. And this silver-haired prophet of Israel walked down the road. Now Samuel is God's chosen priest, God's prophet, and he's also the judge of Israel at that time. And when Israel wanted a king, he anointed Saul. Tall, powerful, strong Saul. Who ended up as rejected Saul. Saul, to put it blunt, he had gone off his head. And his heart grew harder. And he isn't the king that he used to be, or the person that he used to be. And in God's eyes, he's no longer king. Let me read to you from 1 Samuel 16, if you want to turn. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as the king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to, to Jesse of Bethlehem, I have chosen one of his sons to be. Now, let me explain that Israel, in the year 1000 BC, is in a very bad way. Joshua and Moses were history. They were just history models. Israel had gone through about 3,000 years of a spiritual winter. And the faith of the people had actually frozen. And in those days, Israel had no king and everyone was doing what they saw fit. Corruption was the top of the list. It fueled disruption. Immorality was very, very evident including brutality and the people wanted a king and instead of saving the ship Saul had sunk it the Philistines were warring they were bloodthirsty they were monopolizing everything to put it bluntly the Philistines were the bears and the Israelites were the salmon and they were there for the taking. If you know anything about how bears live, they love to feed on salmon. Okay? And Israelites were just being picked off left, right, and center. And corruption from within, danger from without, and Saul was a weak king, and the nation was even weaker. So what's God going to do? And he did what no one else ever imagined. And I've learned over the years, this is my God. What I expect him to do, he doesn't do. Because his wisdom is far greater than my wisdom. I can sit there for weeks pondering and come up with an answer, and God will do it totally different. Because what we try to do with God, we try to put him in a drawer. Oh God, you did this once before, and this is how you did it. So we open the drawer and try to think, well God, you're going to do it again. And I think sometimes he does it just to show me he's God and he can do it any way he wants to do it. What does God do? He issues a surprise invitation to the nobody from Nowheresville. God sent Samuel to Bethlehem. Now in that day, it would have been equal to the new ports of this world and unknown. It was a sleepy village in the foot in the foot in the foothills of Israel, and Bethlehem sits about two thousand feet above the Med, and it looks down on those gentle green hills that flatten out into wonderful pasture outside of Jerusalem. And if you didn't know it, Jesus issued his first cry under the Bethlehem sky. But a thousand years before that, there would be a special babe in a manger. And Samuel entered that village and he walks through pulling an effort. 
And of course his visit begins to turn heads. Because prophets don't normally go to sleepy little villages. And he arrives at the house of Jesse. And Samuel begins to examine each of the sons of Jesse. And more than once Samuel the prophet is ready to wear the blue ribbon to one of them. But God stops him. He looked at Eliab, the oldest, who's the logical choice, and God said, wrong. So he looked at Abinadab, wrong. He came to Shama, now Shama, Samuel's impressed, but God says, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Seven sons passed, seven, seven sons failed. And Samuel turns to Jess and says, well, don't you have another son? And I think Jesse sort of shuddered at that question. Well, I, I've got another son. He's the youngest and he's up on the hillside looking after the sheep. And the word that's used there, by the way, implies more than young age. It suggests his position. David is more than the youngest. He's the little brother. He's the runt of the family, the baby. And if you've not been the baby of the family, you won't really understand this. But it's tough being the youngest male in the family. Sheep watching was the job for the youngest. It's where they can cause the least problems. And David was looked at by his family as the runt. But amazingly, you know, there are 66 chapters dedicated to his life. And the only one who's got more than that is Jesus. The New Testament mentions his name 59 times. And this is the man who's going to establish Jerusalem. The Messiah will be called the son of David. And great psalms come from his pen. He's going to be called a king. He's going to be called a warrior, a minstrel, a giant killer. And yet... To start with, he wasn't even worth looking at by his family. He was a nobody. So tell me, what, God, what caused God to pick him? We've all walked where David walked. We've all walked in the pasture of rejection and exclusion. How often have you and I been measured by our physique? The size of the house that we live in. The colour of our skin. Where we actually work. The position we've got. The qualifications we've got. Or the charisma of our character. It goes on and on. Thank God that's not how we judges. Amen. Always remember what God said. I'm the God that healeth. Friends. There's always hope for those who've been rejected. So let me talk to you about rejection. Romans 8 verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for his all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors 
through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As I shared earlier, people can live in bondage to rejection and not even know it. It causes us to believe lies about ourselves and it undermines our relationship with the Lord. Even though God says he's for us and nothing can separate us, past experiences can still make life difficult. And it's, it's really impossible to avoid feeling rejection sting. So we've got to deal with it by, acknowledge, by acknowledging its presence and discovering its source and letting the Lord help us to overcome. The nature of rejection, it's a painful emotion that is created when someone refuses us and it's got very many negative outcomes. How many of you know that there are three roots of rejection? Or three main ways that rejection through, shows through us. And funny enough, I've looked around this morning and I've seen all three roots in this room. First of all, rebellion. Then you've got self-protection. And then you've got self-rejection. They're the three, all right? Rebellion, self-protection, and self-rejection. And sadly, each of those roots, if allowed to get established, bears its own fruit. And within us, there's going to be one dominant root, which is going to show. It creates a feeling of being excluded or unwanted. And you end up feeling unworthy or we don't fit in. It's actually a form of control. And those who refuse to accept this can influence what we do and what we think. And that leads to self-rejection. We end up being critical of ourselves and we lose our own self-respect. It becomes a syndrome. Those who have never dealt with, the, with their feeling act in ways that cause others to reject them. I was an expert at it. 30, 40 years of my life I walked in rejection and I used to behave in a manner now when I look back. I actually shudder when I look back at it. Because it, it ended up in that we we end up hurting those around us by the way we behave. Let me list some of the feelings that I had in those days. I had a critical spirit towards myself, but also to others. And you'll find that people who've got a low self-esteem often try to bring other people down. I want to bring them down to my level. And I was an expert at it, an absolute expert, that I want to bring them down to my level. Then the other one is that we have difficulty loving other people. If people don't love themselves, how are you going to love someone else? Come on. If you can't love yourself, how are you going to love someone else? We're just not equipped to do it. And here's one of the biggies. A feeling of inferiority. I live with that permanently. I was never good enough. It made me feel that I would never measure up. I'd never make it. And then we become overly attentive to our appearance. 
people who were hurting try to dress in ways that will help them feel accepted. And sadly, I'll say this, they go over the top and they stand out even more so. They become prone to be in perfection. To avoid failure, some people won't even try anything that they can't do perfectly. And that's dangerous, isn't it? When I've also known, they live in a state of floating anger. An attitude of anger is going throughout their lives and leads them to find fault with everyone else. And it's not always that boiling anger. It can be that very quiet, hidden anger, which is continually within, work within each other. And here's another one. We can display an attitude of superiority. We become arrogant. But all we're doing, actually, is covering up our inferiority. We're putting our arrogance over it to try and hide it. And we become oversensitive. Those who struggle with feelings of rejection are easily hurt and prone to misinterpreting what others mean. I tell you this, and this is honesty, before I got healed, someone only had to look at me sideways, and I took exception. And it would take me a week or more to get over it. As simple as that. They don't even have to look at me the wrong way. And they might not even have meant it. But I took exception to it. And we resist being loved. People who don't feel worthy have got a great difficulty at accepting affection. Very suspicious. Some people become suspicious of anyone who's trying to help them. Because they always look in... What do they want? There's an ulterior motive behind it. And we become aloof. Just to avoid rejection, some people end up being loners. How many of you know you can live in a, live in a, in a church and still be a loner? Surrounded by people, yet alone. And depression. When people feel unworthy, the next step is to end up being sad and discouraged. Being cheated out of life. If you can't overcome your emotions, then the effect of rejection, you miss most of God's blessings. And you become materialistic. To feel wanted, some people have got to have possessions. I've got to have more, and I've got to have more, and I've got to have more. And you're just trying to prove a point. As I said, you can miss God's plan. And we end up adopting the wrong practices. I know all about these things. Because I carried an emotional crutch for 40 odd years. So I'm not talking just with knowledge, I'm talking with experience. Let me talk to you about the reasons for being rejected. Now the underlying cause for this painful emotion is a person's opinion of themselves, which is brought about normally by a hurtful experience. You might have a physical defect. Not like, you know, how you look. You might be too short. I've even known people who are too tall who are walking around bent in half trying to hide the height that they are. It's not just the short. It can be the tall as well. <coughs> Past emotional hurts. When a person is hurt, that damage can linger and linger and linger. And the, the death of a loved one some people interpret loss as rejection because they end up feeling alone. And in their eyes, they feel that God has turned their back on them. And what about divorce? 
a very painful experience because both spouses and the children are affected and they can feel that they've been discarded. And the mind was childhood experience. Words of criticism and rejection, they stick in a child's mind and they shape you as to where you're going. So let me come to it. How do we overcome rejection? Well, first of all, the negative feelings have got to be dealt with. You've got to be completely true with yourself. You can't make up stories about yourself of how you want to be and start accepting that. You've got to look at yourself in the mirror. I used to tell people when they used to come to me for ministry, I used to say to them, stick a photograph on the bottom of the stairs and every time you pass that photograph, look at it and say, I love you. Or every time you look in the mirror, I love you. Not cringe. I love you. Because that's what God created. Amen? Three essential things that comprise a healthy attitude. And God will give you all of them. You need to get a sense of belonging. Those who are part of the body of Christ, we belong to God's family. Once we get this fixed in our hearts, we can begin to feel secure. Then you've got this feeling of worthiness. Jesus considers us so valuable that he is willing to die in our place. That's how valuable you are, and you need to get all of it. And a sense of competence. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. And one of his jobs is to enable you and I to accomplish whatever God asks us to do. So let me start to wind this up, because this is only an introduction. There's no need to go through life being handicapped by past experiences. Let me make a point here. Why did Jesus die on the cross? That you might be free. So why on earth are you walking around allowing all these past things to take your freedom away from you? You were saying to Jesus, it didn't work. You might not like me saying that, but it's the truth. He set us free, and he wants us to walk in freedom, and he needs for you and I to allow him to deal with these past experiences. The first step to gaining victory over rejection is by recognizing it. You need to recognize that you're suffering from it. And that's why I brought it this morning. There's no way we're going to get complete healing here this morning. There's no magic wand. Let me tell you that now. There's no magic wand. But if you, be, if you recognize that you're struggling with it and suffering from it, you're on the first rung of the ladder. Okay? And then you need to get ministry. And that might, I warn you, might not be uh, quite as vigorous as mine, but that might need some deliverance. And you might begin to understand why Satan has taken advantage of your hurt. He wants to keep you locked up in it. Amen. Why be locked up in it? Jesus came that you could be free. Amen. Now here's a biggie. This is where rejected people have great difficulty. Ask God's forgiveness for allowing hurtful emotions to hinder us. In other words, you're asking God to forgive you. Oh, we're very good, we can forgive others. But when it comes down to us, 
That's a different thing altogether. We've got a big list. Oh, well, God, I've got all of this in my life. I can't. Blah, blah, blah. The first step, church, you've got to learn to forgive yourself. Listen, I'm going to make a little. I can forgive you. But you've got to forgive yourself. Otherwise, the equation didn't work out. God can forgive you. I can forgive you. But if you don't forgive yourself, that equation is not complete. You will walk around forever and ever carrying all the different things. Are we saying to Jesus, well, you did it for everybody else, but you can't, I, you can't deal with my things. They're too big. Come on. He died that we might be set free. And let's get into that abundance, that fullness of life. And you might have to deal with the way that you've treated others. And you might just have to go and ask them for forgiveness. But that's where healing begins to flow. But here's the big one. And this is something I have learned. As I said, experience speaks better than knowledge. My experience is that you and I will always have to deal with rejection. Sadly, it had become a way of life to me. For 40 odd years, I walked in it. But when I began to recognize rejection, then I began to do something about it. You're, basically, when you recognize rejection, you shut the door to rejection. What you say to it is that something happens in your life and, you've got, and rejection immediately comes up. Now you've got a choice. You can either go down the path that rejection is offering you, the old path, or you can say, no, I'm going down God's path. All right? It took me a while, as I, I used to share with Marion and others, that, as I said earlier, somebody'd look at me sideways and take me a week to get over it. But you know, I learned after a while, as I began to walk and refuse to go down rejection's path, I began to master it. Instead of a week, it took me a day. Now it takes me a second. Somebody tries to get on my case, I just flatly refuse to go down rejection's path. I'm not going. You can try, but I'm not going down there. I'm going to go down God's path. Amen? Amen. So you're beginning to understand you're never going to get rid of rejection, but you've got to learn to master it. As I said, little by little, I began to recognize rejection. But then I began to refuse to act. And it used to come up fairly regular. You'd be amazed what people in church say to a pastor. They're not always nice words. Let me assure you. And I've many times I could have taken my ball home and disappeared and gone up the mountain somewhere. But what point does it serve? So in the end I learned, I thought, no, I am not walking your path. Rejection. I've shut the door. I'm going where God wants me to go. Amen? What I'm trying to say to you is that with the power of the Lord in your lives, we can overcome. And we can become victors of rejection. We walk the path the Lord has given us. And I want to say this to you tonight. You can become a... Tonight, this morning. All right? You can become... A David for the Lord. Amen. Amen? Yeah. You can overcome. You can overcome and you can come, become a David. But first of all, you have to recognize that you're struggling with rejection. Master it. And go through the things that I said. Forgiveness. Accepting yourself as you are. Stop making it up stories about what you would like to be. See yourself as you are. Accept it 
and then start building from there. Amen. Amen. You know where I am if you want to talk to me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, you lot.